Hey there, it's me, Phil. Welcome back to the show. This is the Phil Fisher Podcast. I am here with Christian Taylor. Hey, Phil. Hi, Christian. And Sky Jatani. Hi. Hi. You're both wearing blue and red, and one of you is also wearing white. That would be me. But you're like you're like star spangled banner. You are lady. S- you are spangled. I am. I'm feeling so patriotic. You are today. spangled because you just came back from France. I did. And you're trying to reassert your American. Oh no! I had my French oh, no. red beret on when I walked in. Oui, I just forgot oui. to wear it, so I'm trying to meld the two together. Mm. All right, theme song. And then we'll ask you why you were in France. Hey, it's a podcast. What do you know? Hey, it's a podcast. And we got video. Hey, it's a podcast. So in and here, the Phil Fisher podcast starts right here. Oh, we'll talk to Sky. Hello. And Christian too. Howdy do. She's back from France to talk to you. Hey, it's a podcast, so lend an ear. The Phil Fisher Podcast starts right here. The Phil Fisher Podcast starts right here. You didn't do any French pee stuff on that one. Hello! <laughs> Hello, Christian! Hello! Back from France! I am. Are you Philippe or Jean? I am Philippe. Philippe, Philippe. I am Philippe, for my name is Philippe. <laughs> that would be my name in French. That's true. <laughs> it would be your name in French. I yeah. just put that together. Wow. In Spanish, I am Felipe. <laughs> Oh, of course. Felipe! That's what they called me in Spanish in high school. Uh, Okay, so in a nutshell, why were you in France? I was in France because I have begun filming an amazing documentary. And I was going over there for the pre-production work to form relationships and hear some stories. What's what's the documentary in a nutshell? The documentary, you can find it on IMDb. It's called The Girl Who Wore Freedom. It is set to premiere in 2019. Our 2018 will finish and then hopefully start uh, distributing it in 2018. So it's a, a fantastic story. It's a love a story, love affair story, I think, okay. between France and the in America. And um, our heroine is Danny Patrice, who was five at the time of the, um, you know, Allied invasion of no. uh, occupied France and. Uh, it's just an incredible story about what the Americans did for the French people who were so oppressed and wanting in so many areas. And the French have never forgotten, and they tell their children and their grandchildren. And um, it's just an amazing thing to see. When we were there, they were so excited that we were coming over to tell their story. You know, yeah. so much has been told about World War II, but it's usually from the military perspective. Right. And um, in my research, I found very little about the French people and how they felt and what effect it had what on them. What was it like for you? Is that the question? Yeah, pretty much. We we uh, were asking them more about, um, we talked to one woman who's in her 90s who was alive before Germany ever invaded France in 1939. Wow. So she could remember the good old days. Mm-hmm. And then she could talk about, wow. you know, the four years that they were occupied as well as the liberation. She was 14 when that happened. So getting that incredible perspective was uh, eye-opening. We learned lots of things I've never read about, nor had, you know, a couple of historians that I talked to read about. So we have to wait a couple of years, a year and a half to see that. But it's great you're capturing these stories before these Mm. folks are gone. Yeah, you know, they actually said that to us. Mm. They said, you know, um, we're not long for this world Mm -hmm. and we're happy to tell our story. Many people there said they had never talked about it. They'd kept it in their heads. And we were at dinner at one time with a father who was sharing stuff that he said he'd kept into his in his head for 73 years. And he was telling it to us and his children at the table had never heard it. You know? Wow. I mean, it was, it was powerful stuff, but they're ready to talk and wow. they wanna make sure that the world understands. And I think the reason is they see the fracturedness of the world that we live in now. And they see how um, tenuous, you know, liberty and love and unity are. Mm -hmm. And I think they want to tell what it was like when everyone was against each other and when everyone was fighting and there was hatred and, you know, bigotry and all of that. Kind of like today? 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think they want to share their story because they feel like it's so relevant all of a sudden. Yeah. And um, what I learned I, is that I agree, and that if we talk about our past, we can be liberated from repeating it. You know, and when you focus on, I think the love and the restoration and the unity that came from it, I think it inspires us to work harder for that today. Right. So that's our hope with the film. Well, we can't, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing just the trailer. So yeah. we'll have to. The trailer yeah. should be out soon. And what, you're, you're making it right now? Yeah, we're making it right now. You're trailering? We're trailering. It's gonna be phenomenal. Uh, I have a fantastic director named Vincent Shade uh, working on the project. He's a young director. Is that his real name or is that his stage it's, name? It's actually Vincent, Shade. Vincent Vladimir Shade. Yeah, Ooh. that's his real name. He left out the Impaler. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, a great name, I love it. So My, I'm assuming that trailer will be out on like YouTube and available. Yeah, for, we're yeah. gonna we're gonna put it out everywhere. We're we're gonna have a website and we're gonna have uh, Facebook pages and you guys can follow along. We will also have ways to support us. We are raising money, of course, to do this. It's about a two hundred thousand dollar budget, which is really small actually mm-hmm. for what we want to do. Um, and we're gonna keep a very light crew, about six people, and we're gonna film it in the new way. You know, kind of like not the old On studio way. Uh, this in, during this time, we filmed with one drone um, as you know until it was um, till several of the parts were stolen uh, oh. after we had crashed it three times. Those are some very interesting stories. So oh. we we filmed with the drone and we filmed with um, a Canon, you know, five D, and we filmed with two iPhones. Okay. And so uh, we did. Okay. We did some pretty amazing stuff with the little tools that we had in our hand. So, well, cool. Well, yeah. we'll look forward to hearing more yeah, stories. Yeah, I'll fill about keep that. you posted. Thanks for asking. Mm-hmm. Okay, first news story. What was what happened last night? The, the Emmys. The, the Emmys. The Emmys. The Emmys. Yeah. Did you see those? Uh, no, I didn't. <laughs> I, I just read about it. I watched them. You did? Yeah. Stephen Colbert was. You know. He's the host. He, he was in rare and form. And the big winner was. Not a network. Yeah. yeah. Was it Netflix? HBO? Who um, was it? Well, what was the top sh- I, I, show? I didn't watch the I summary. Know so. The show that won the most awards. I know nothing. I didn't watch the summary of really? it. I just sort of watched it as it went along, and I went to bed before it ended. So you what tell me. It, well, Hulu's first big show. What, which was? Which was? You, boy, you really don't follow this, I don't do follow this. You don't what follow do I care? This. The Handmaid's Tale. Yeah. I don't even know what that is. You don't even know what that is. You should probably read up on that. Well, it got a gazillion nominees. Do you know who Elizabeth Moss is? Yes, I do. It's She's a, Jeb Bartlett's daughter. Yes. Yes, she is. Greatest show ever. I love which, that wait, show. Which show. Jeb Bartlett, West Wing. West Wing. Oh, really? I can never yeah. think okay. of him then, as anything and else. And I just know her from Mad Men. Mad Men, too. Mad Men. Yeah. She was yeah. the secretary in Mad Men. Right. And then she who's, went off and did another show. Whose doctor was, was smoking while she was pregnant. She's yeah. been nominated for uh, the Emmy, uh, eight, this was her eighth personal nomination wow. and her f- first win. So she was nominated seven times before now and, and never won. Anyway, and she's also the executive producer of the show. She came on the show as an executive producer, so it's kind of a big deal. Mm-hmm. You don't know what The Handmaid's Tale is? I vaguely. <clears throat> I had to watch a few episodes because I knew it was up for, I knew it was up for a bunch of awards, and I knew that um, it was being hailed as important for this cultural moment. Okay. So, and I knew it involved women dressing like Puritans, which you're always in for, but bright red Puritans. Which I'm always in for. <laughs> that was that was wow. really snuck in there. We, I, I am not quite what? sure how to respond to it, but to I did hear it. That for a second. No, no, no. Okay. Let's not. So Let's re- not. red like communist Puritans. No, no, no just no. red. Oh, just red. Literally red. They wear red robes and then white hats, white bonnets. Okay. Yeah, and so women have started to wear that outfit to protest marches. Like the the March on Washington, the Women's March on Washington, there were women dressed as the handmaids from a handmaid's. Okay, so give us the basic plot. Dystopian future. Okay. If you can believe that. Why are people so attracted to that when we're basically living it? A dystopian future, but not really in the future. It's like a kind of an alternate, you know, this is where we could be. It's one of those shows that says this is what our lives could be like in just a couple years if we're not careful. Mm -hmm. And what they're like is um, fertility rates have fallen dangerously low, Mm -hmm. especially for some reason among the upper class. Mm -hmm. So if you are a woman who is fertile, 
you are kind of seized by the state as the property of the state, and you are made to be a, a concubine for the upper class. To propagate the to population. To try to keep the population going. Okay. Yes. But before then, they, there's, there's a lot of us and they in this show. Yeah. And I kept, like for two episodes, I kept asking, who's the they? Who is the they? But the they quote the Bible a lot. The they greet each other by saying um, uh, blessing in his blessing and blessed be the fruit, which. The theme song is Tis the Gift to Be Simple. Is it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Tis the Gift to Be Simple, Tis the Gift to Be Free. Okay. Um, the they uh, doesn't, the, the first when they, the they takes op- over power. Mm-hmm. Basically, someone was in the White House and then there was some, uh, and they don't, they, they take forever to unpack the backstory. So I'm trying, who? What happened? How did it end up like this? Um, there were some terrorist attacks. There was a threat of terrorist attacks. So, so the they had to declare martial law, you know, temporarily, just like Emperor Palpatine. Mm-hmm. That's always how it starts, mm-hmm. just temporarily, and then we'll give our powers back. And then they make make it illegal for women to own property. Um, they make it illegal for women to have jobs outside the home. Um, they, and then they start seizing women and, and, and shooting their husbands if their husbands don't want them to be seized. And then re, retraining women. People try to flee to Canada to get away from the new regime. And they never name. I'm and, like, and they can't get to Mexico because of the wall. They can't get to Mexico. The wall's too big. Yeah. It's a hundred feet high. Uh, but they so they're shot trying to sneak into Canada, trying to get away. The the fertile women are sent to kind of reprogramming centers that are where they all dress like the Amish. So my first thought was, have the Amish gone nuts? It's like the Amish have taken over America, mm-hmm. and they're crazy people. Um, so I went online and I was reading the review of the book. It's Margaret right. Atwood's book, The Handmaid's Tale, which is considered a very important feminist book. Okay. In the book description, the, the they is described as a rebirth of the Puritans. But with more fashion. Yeah, and they drive big black SUVs and they have automatic weapons. Wow. That's very Puritan. <laughs> It's sort of gangster Puritan. <laughs> I, that reminds me of being in Paris during this trip. Have you guys ever been to Paris recently? No. Uh, I was there. No. I don't remember. 2001. I mean, it's been a while. Everywhere in the streets, you have like fatigued out, automatic weaponed out military men everywhere. I was at it's Paris. It's a new reality. I was at France Pavilion and Epcot Center, and they didn't have that. <clears throat> well, they should add that to be more realistic, ooh, I guess. I tell you what. But they did have croissants. Need more paramilitary. Yeah, and Scary. cigarettes. So, so uh, yeah, it's one of those, remember the book, um, the mm-hmm. novel, the Christian Nation? Yeah, I knew you know? where you were going. I was, I was like, how did you say yes before you finished? I exactly where you was going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where I don't, so unpack that for me. It's It was a kind of paranoid secularist vision of this is what conservative Christians if would they take do over. if they took over. But isn't this what... Which included bombing San Francisco to kill all the gay people and Rick Warren becoming the the uh, director, the, uh, the secretary of health for the country. It was just bizarre. But isn't, crazy this, isn't this what both sides tend to do is they paint the most horrific vision yeah. of what the future will be if the other side gets power yeah. in order to frighten their own side into mobilization. I just don't, and they, they keep quoting scripture, you know, so they, the whole thing behind the handmaid is the story of Jacob and, and Rachel and Leah, uh-huh. you know, and it's, well, I can't have babies, so I give to you my handmaid. Mm-hmm. And so that's what America has to do. And it's, it's, but they're, they're, they, they take things that I don't, I've never met anyone who believes them, and then they say, "Well, this is the future." Well, that's like if conservative I, Christians. I remember back in two thousand eight, have their way when Obama was first running for president, or if the Amish go mad in two thousand eight when Obama was first running. Uh, I think it was James, what's his name, James Dobson, put out this letter talking about what America would be like in twenty sixteen if Obama's elected president. Ooh, you remember that? 
No, I remember it. And it was like this. Ho- it was letter. like this horrible vision of this dystopian America that you was know, anyone walking around in red robes with white bonnets. I don't think so, but it was it was the conservative vision yeah. of a horrible liberal right. America. Right. Look, you and, know what? And but and you go okay. We're in 2017 now. He was president for eight years. Things were decided or decisions that were made that conservatives didn't totally agree with, but we're still here. Well, you, you know, know, but this not, is a this is the same song we second verse. We are, are. We still here. <laughs> the, the, we are still here. We're in the same <laughs> cultural battles that have existed for centuries. You I know? Ju- it just the, the question is in this in this story, let's say the handmaid's tale. Yeah. Yes, I mean, I think if you look at the surface of that, yes, you can see this liberal story of them painting this horrible picture of if the conservative right took over. But it can also be a mirror for us to look into as Christians, you know, and there can be a good thing in that. What did we learn looking into this mirror? Well, I don't know. What do you think we learn? I, I, I don't learn anything. I learned that you need to make sure the Amish don't get automatic weapons because <laughs> they'll go postal. I, the, I don't think you're thinking hard enough. <laughs> well, what it, what it does reveal, though, is it, and the fact that the book was written as one thing, the fact that it's a TV show is another thing, the fact that it's gained so much the attention. The fact that it's hailed as important. Right. Well, it, it what it says to me is the two spectrums in our country, the conservative, Christian, and mm-hmm. then the more uh, liberal, secularist, really don't know one another. Right. They just have completely bought into the stereotype of the other. And that is that doesn't bode well for the future for any of us. Because I, just, I just think it, it, it shows that, for example, if you want to write a show and say, okay, this is what America would look like if the Muslims took over, you should have a few Muslim friends. Exactly. To check your work. Because I have a feeling it will change what you do. And, and if Christians want to write a book that says, this is what America would look like if the atheists took over, you should have a few atheist friends to check your work. And this is a case where clearly Margaret Atwood does not have any conservative Christian friends. It's not hung out with the but Amish. But you know what? I'm going to get cut her a little bit of slack. No, Be- I'm not. I am. Okay. Because I think that we as a Christian culture and a you know Republican you know, I mean, I can speak it because I've been in it, you know, a Republican Christian wing. Um, I think we have done ourselves a lot of disservice by the way that we have treated others and by the way that we have responded politically. And so I do think there is a lot to be learned in the way that we interact with our culture and those that are less fortunate or different looking or believe differently. And yeah. Just for illustration purposes and how ridiculous this whole yeah. genre really is. Can I read a few highlights of James Dobson's 20, 2008 oh, predictions? Yeah, okay. Let's see. What, okay, this is what James Dobson thought 2016 would be like if Barack Obama was elected And he president. was right about some things. Ready? So okay. here's one. The Supreme Court would pass law that legalized same-sex marriage across the United States. That's I think true. I believe that happened. That did happen. Christian radio stations will be removed from the airwaves. That did not no, happen. I, I don't believe that happened. Churches will be forced to hire homosexuals and host homosexual weddings. No. Did not happen. No. Um, Christian nurses and doctors will be banned from practice. Did not mm, happen. No. Pornography is mandated to be openly displayed in gas stations, newsstands, and grocery stores. Okay, now that's just ridiculous. Mm, Homeschooling ridiculous. has been outlawed. No. Don't think Four so. U.S. cities have been bombed. Obama does nothing in response. What? What? <laughs> Obama increases funding to known terrorist allies. Okay, this is just getting worse. <laughs> Obama deepens ties to communist nations and communist revolutions break out in Latin America. What? Okay, I didn't see that. What was one. He Russia smoking? retakes all of Eastern Europe, emboldened by the fact that Obama is weak. Okay, say that took, one again. They took Crimea. Take, take that again. Wait, they, Russia, that pause? Russia retakes all of Eastern Europe, emboldened by the fact that Obama is weak. Is, does Crimea qualify as all of Eastern Not Europe? Not all of Eastern Europe, but it is okay. an interesting. There was a chunk. There was a nibble. This, this there is, was a nibble. There, there was a nibble. Tel Aviv is destroyed when New Russia launches a nuclear attack against Israel. Uh, yeah, that, that did not did that, happen. Wait, wait, did it? That no, d- no, no, it didn't. no, 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 no. But I'm saying like that. But no. the whole point of these things is not to accurately predict the future. The goal is to mobilize, it's to scare people, to scare people, to, to mobilize yeah. your Jared base. Witless. And and handmade tale is probably for yeah. some liberals. That's what they're they're thinking. Oh my goodness, if we if we let these evangelicals <clears throat> run another election, this is what we're in for. Yeah. Do you know what the future Christian Amish mafia does if they find out that you're gay? 
What? Re- reprogramming schools, concentration There's some camps. some of that. They also capture your lover and hang them in front of you. Mm. That's what. Well, what, Christ, which one though? Not because if I know it should be both. Right. In that's kind of each, weird. I, it is very odd, but that's what they do. Anyway, it's just bizarre. And th- so basically all fertile women are kept as concubines mm. by the ruling class. For some reason, the entire upper class has become Puritan. I don't know how that happened. Mm-hmm. That seems unlikely. That that that's very far fetched. That the, the the wealthiest people, yeah. And they and the, the first sign. Can you see Donald Trump? The first sign becoming that, a Puritan. Well, see, and so many people, <laughs> even Elizabeth Moss has said we had no idea when we started making right. this how relevant it would be because of Donald Trump. But so the assumption is that Donald Trump, he's just the first like. Like he's the, like the antithesis of this. Like though. the Puritans, they're they're back from the dead, and they've chosen Donald Trump as their man. And now, then, because the first thing that shows up is the the lead uh, Elizabeth Moss character in a, in a going back into the past to say when did this start yeah. to manifest itself, tries to buy a, a cup of coffee in a coffee shop, and her bank account is empty. Yeah, and it's because the federal government has seized all the money of women and transferred it into their husband's accounts where it should be. Here's the thing. When you look at uh, religious regimes, totalitarian religious regimes in the world yeah. today, you think yeah. of like Iran with the Ayatollahs, or you think of ISIS with al-Baghdadi and those guys. Like, yes, they're taking rights away from women, they're imposing religious doctrines upon the whole society, but these groups are being led by ideologues. Yeah. Like people who firmly believe in their religious ideas and are willing to violently impose them upon everybody else. Everyone who's listening to this podcast knows I am no fan of Donald Trump. But the man is, that is true? the man is not an ideologue. No. That's for sure. You know, he, he he's <laughs> just kind of a log. I, <laughs> <laughs> there aren't many ideas. <laughs> But uh, that's you. it. Yeah. But I mean, if he has any ideology, it's his own narcissism. That's and he, sure. he is not a principled, right. religiously <laughs> devout person who's As trying to last impose. Week, he may be a Democrat. Yeah. So I just like I, there's a lot to be critical of him and his leadership and, and his ideas, but they're not rooted in some kind of vision of imposing yeah. religious law upon the society. Yeah. I just think anyone who does this and by the way, it's a very well made show, of course, mm-hmm. or it wouldn't be. You know, as it wouldn't be winning Emmys. What doesn't just win Emmys for its importance in identifying future threats. Right. Of, it's well produced. I do wonder if you did the same show about Muslims taking over America, would you get anywhere near an Emmy? You, well, that's not the threat at the moment. Well, for some people, they think really? it is. Really? Well, it's really According not. to whom? So the threat at the moment is... The threat at the MoMA is moment is, is North Korea. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. North Koreans taking over America. I yeah. guess that was a show or, that you might know, get putting some it out. traction. No, but, but it's, the, not, the, it's not uh, provocative at it, all. You, well, there was that... Uh, somebody proposed doing a show about a hypothetical dystopian future if the Confederacy had won yeah. the oh, Civil right, War. Right. And I don't... I, there was some controversy about that. It yeah, may it's have gotten still a, in development. But there was temptation or... Be- because there would be slavery. Right. Slavery would still exist. And a lot of people said, do we really want to portray that? Do we really want our you know, mm-hmm. our kids watching that portrayed as if it's still true? So it is interesting that some dystopian futures are okay to depict. Depends on who you make look bad. Exactly. And others are not. Yeah. Depending. I so, know. Yeah. so, okay, maybe I'm missing the point. Maybe you're a big fan of The Handmaid's Tale, and it's a well made show, and I assume a well written book. I haven't read the book. So, maybe the point is it, maybe it's an allegory about not standing up for yourself and your rights when they're eroding. I'll grant that. It just seems like such a bizarre premise such a weird it seems like a storyline that could only be conceived of someone who has no working knowledge of actual real conservative christians but can i just say one thing no there are a ton of people out there in my opinion even in the so-called christian community that do not have a real working understanding of legitimate followers of jesus well, yeah, but how how many of them have bumped into Christians that don't believe women should be allowed to own property? You're missing my point. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, the the goal that we should all say is if whatever wherever you find yourself on the political spectrum or cultural spectrum or religious spectrum, please reach out to somebody who's different than you and just sit down and say, tell me what. Before you write a, a book about them. Right. Like, th- we're not as different as people make both sides not, out to be. Not all of us, but there is there's, yeah, a, there's crazies. A, whole, a whole, we talk about them all the time. Yes, there are crazies out there. We there are crazies the on the left and there are crazies yeah, but on the right. See, but, and that's the point. I could write a show based on the most extremist things ever said by any atheist, ever. Right. I could put together a show that would absolutely shock you, but it would be a horrible misportrayal of what most atheists believe. Correct. Right. So, and I could do the same thing with Muslims. I could do the same thing with exactly. But even the, even the things that in there, I don't know that anyone has said a lot of these things uh, that in the conservative Christian world. I don't know where you would go to find the bizarre things. Well, let me in just this say show. this. Here's, yeah. Here, here's what we are guilty of. What are okay? we guilty of? We are guilty of, you know, in my opinion, you know, as a Christian culture, not discounting the crazies of not going out and loving our fellow man in such a passionate, uh, reckless abandon that the rest of the United States thinks, oh my goodness, these are Christians? Well, I wanna be one. Well, I think there are Christians who are doing that. They're just not the ones who get profiled and put on television and stereotyped. Yeah, I don't think you can paint the broad brush of Christian culture does this or doesn't do this because there's no such thing as a Christian culture. There's well, that's myriad. true, except for the way, you know, we portray or the world sees us. Well, well and that there's comes, perception, that there's comes reality. down to the editing right. on the TV news, which right. is true for Muslims as well. Right. It's the way we perceive them is what we see on the news. That could be true, except that I have talked to a lot of people that are not Christians, that aren't necessarily speaking about Christians because of what they see on the news, but how so-called Christians have treated them. Well, yeah. Whether they're homosexuals or Jews or yeah. African if you, Americans. If you bump into a jerk and the jerk says, I'm a Christian, yeah. that changes your view of Christians. But sometimes, That's not an indictment of the Christian culture, though. Sometimes they're just jerks. Sometimes they're just jerks. Like, you know, how many of the, uh, the guys marching in Charlottesville said, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. Many. Yeah. Why? Because that's what they were told when they were kids. You're a Christian. Right. Now, when you, they pushed, uh, they were interviewing one of them, and they pushed a little deeper and said, okay, and he said, well, actually, I'm, I personally, I'm more of an Odinist, which a, a, lot, of, <laughs> a lot of white supremacists Which means he are, worships Anthony Hopkins. Are Odinists. <laughs> I think, Sky, you make a very good point. What Thank was, you. What was his point, that they worship Anthony Hopkins? Yeah, let's move on. Okay, we have a guest. Woo-hoo. Our, our guest. Are you still here, guest? <laughs> I am. I'm, I'm enjoying every word. <laughs> okay, good. And if there's anything you'd like to add, just, you know, jump on in. Our guest is Jared Patrick Boyd, JPB. Not to be confused with PB and J. JP <laughs> and B. Uh, Jared is a pastor, a spiritual director, and founder of, this is awesome. I have no idea what this is, but I'm telling you, awesome. it's awesome. He's the founder of the Order of Sustainable Faith. Do they wear red cloaks and hoodies? I don't know. I think it's Christians that uh, recycle. I'm not sure. <laughs> a missional monastic order for the 21st century. See, now it's even more appealing. Mm. Although it would have been better if it, that we were reading this in the 20th century. And then you said this was uh. a monastic order for the 21st century because my assumption would be they're in space. Hmm. They're floating in space and they're That's missional. That's a great place to be a monastic. And monastic. Sure is, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. It's awfully like quiet up there. Mm-hmm. Do we need to recreate the Desert Fathers, but in space? No one can hear you scream in space. The Space Fathers. <laughs> can you stay on I'm track? I'm going to make a movie. We're, we're I'm going to make a movie we're called The Space Fathers. Jared. Okay. You know, this is about <clears throat> him. Jared Patrick Boyd is our guest today. <laughs> he, this is even better. He and his wife are planting Franklinton Abbey. He's planting an abbey. Like you get, a, you get a tiny little abbey and you bury it in the ground and then you water it. A new faith community on the west side of Columbus, Ohio. That's an unusual place to be. This just gets to better. Abbey. Is there like an upstairs and a downstairs? <laughs> Do you ring a little bell for your tea? <laughs> okay, Jared, are you still with us? We're, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm with you. So mean. Although the, the, the space idea is very intriguing. That's me. compelling, isn't it? It's compelling. It is very compelling, yeah. 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 If Jesus was here today, and he went off for 40 days in the wilderness, would he go to space? No. <laughs> Is there any wilderness left? 
Yeah. Yeah. Where? Alaska. Alaska. Oh, that's yeah. for sure. Like He'd be like wild. a survivalist somewhere. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I have this image of like Buck Rogers in the 21st Monastery. <laughs> Jared has a new book. I'm holding it up if you're watching the video. It's called Imaginative Prayer. And it has a child appearing to be dancing on the cover. Uh, a year-long guide for your child's spiritual formation. So we're talking about spiritual formation, and Jared is talking about imaginative prayer. Um, before we get to that, let's back up a bit. Tell us a bit of your story. What what tradition did you grow up in? And, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the two-minute version of what's your own spiritual journey? Yeah, so I grew up uh, in the Nazarene Church. So... And then when I was about 16, I, yeah, the little ding. I like that, by the Thank way. Thank you. Um, Taco the bell. Product placement bell. Uh, is, that, is that what it is? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was so Every it. time, like, so I'm not I sure why Nazarene got a any bell. Brand. But... It's a brand. It's a brand name. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It gets a shout out. So when I was 16, I started going to the Vineyard Church. Okay. I was waiting for the ding. Oh, there <laughs> I was waiting okay. for the ding. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, uh, and then I've been a part of the Vineyard since. So I've been a part of the Vineyard for about 23 That's years That's why he's planting. Vineyard planting. Yeah, yeah, it's all in his brain. Yeah, that's kind of our language. Right? I get it. Uh, but you've gone, you've clearly gone in a, it says right here, a missional monastic sort of a direction. How did that transformation happen? Was it a transformation or did it just seem obvious all along? No, it was definitely a transformation. We, um, we were still part of the vineyard and um, about six or eight years ago, I started sensing a desire to, to plant a church or a church planting movement. Um, but every time I imagined the kind of place I wanted to plant, uh, what kind of came to my mind was more like a monastery. <laughs> yeah. And so, so are, Okay, wait a minute, back up. <laughs> yeah. In, in, in common understanding, monastic and missional seem to be contradictory. Because mm, people think of point. think of monastic as withdrawal and introspection and isolation, whereas missional is going out. The Benedict and, and option. And engage, yeah. And Did you take the Benedict yeah. option? So how do you reconcile those two things, or what do you mean by monastic, missional, whatever? Yeah, I think I think you're right. That is the common perception. But if you look at the history of monasticism, you know you've you've got to pay attention to folks like the Franciscans and the Jesuits and the Dominicans, all of which were outwardly focused. And the Notice Franciscans, he did not mention the Benedictines. He did not mention he the Benedictines. Mention. Well, it's just, it's just, I mean, but even those guys and, and gals uh, to some degree, you know, they were missional in the sense that they had a, a ministry of hospitality right. and the world was really rough. And so they would welcome travelers. Right. And, you know, our, our modern day hospital basically comes from the ministry of hospitality that these monasteries um, participated in. Right. So when we were working through this process, I was trying to understand why do I sense a call to plant something more monastic? I'm in the vineyard. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. <laughs> but we, um, I spent about two years researching the history of monasticism and their cloistered forms, which is what you described, the Benedictine Cistercians as well as in the, the mendicant forms, which are more missional. They're outward. what? They're what? What was the other word? Uh, mendicant. Mendicant orders. Yeah. Mendicant. So like this is that. where the Jesuits, the Franciscans, the Dominicans, and they were always like engaged in the life of their city, their right. community. And were there, were so, there, um, <clears throat> were there monasteries away from town and they would travel into town or were there monasteries actually in towns? It's both. Um, in fact, a lot of um, early monasteries were actually right in the heart of the city, mm-hmm. and a lot of women would um, kind of cloister themselves in the heart of the city and serve the poor. And so, if you start digging through the history, you you get this really interesting mix of all different kinds of forms. I mean, the form we think of is we think of Thomas Merton. You know, we think of um, you know, these folks that are kind of cloistered away from society. Right. But, you know, you think about Mother Teresa, you think about Ignatius of Loyola, um, you think about St. Francis and the Franciscans, the Dominicans, you know, they, these people started schools, they fed the poor, they started hospitals, um, and they, they brewed beer and, and made honey and all kinds of wonderful things. And they things. evangelized, they preached the gospel. And they evangelized, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Okay. So, so which thing are you trying to do? So we're trying to take the best of both. 
So um, I think that some people are are going to be led in a way. I think the best thing for some people is stability, and so. For those who feel drawn to stability, we're trying to create a framework for them to do that. And others, I think, are drawn more towards, you know, going wherever God may lead them at whatever time. Mm-hmm. And so, particularly in our culture, we're not a very stable people. Right. Um, I think of a book, uh, Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove wrote a, a book a number of years ago called The Wisdom of Stability. Bing. There you go. Um, <laughs> I, love I know it's your job. I just love it. Um, and so I think that for some people, stability is actually the, the way to go, um, yeah. to say, I'm going to be in this place with these people for the next. Does uh, This is an irrelevant question, but I, but I find it interesting. Different people have different propensities and different wirings, you know, in, in kind of mm-hmm. how they want to engage the world. Does, do you think we should play does god want us to play against our wirings or with our wirings so if i really would rather be by myself does that mean god wants me to be with people a lot and and be in the city and if i really want to be with people a lot does he want me to go out into the wilderness for a while he's asking for a friend i'm asking for a friend (laughs) i think um, i mean this is where maybe i'm not going to be super helpful because i'm going to say it depends it depends on why you have that particular desire. So okay. if you desire to be away from people and that is rooted in some, you know, malformed or, you know, disintegration. Yeah. What if you know? just find them a little bit annoying? So, yeah, uh, I don't know. I'm, I mean, this is where, you know, this is where my my spot clearly in the vineyard is. I'm just going to say the Holy Spirit will lead you, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, it's for his friend, remember. Nice. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. For, yeah. Uh, lead for your, your friend. friend. Nice denominational cop-out. Okay, so your book is called Imaginative Prayer. Um, that obviously raises a very good first question. What the heck is imaginative prayer? Is that when we pray for imaginary things? Um, no. So imaginative prayer is actually drawn from the exercises of St. Ignatius, who stole it from Rudolf of Saxony, who was a 14th century Carthusian monk. Basically, Wasn't he the bad the guy in Ghostbusters is, too? <laughs> <laughs> you, you put yourself imaginatively into a story and you, you turn that into a prayer. So for example, the, the really easy example that I may use is, um, you know, you, you could be, you know, slowly reading through Psalm 23 and imagining that, you know, the Lord is your shepherd or the Lord is anointing your head with oil. And you turn that process into a prayer. And oftentimes it's done with the gospel stories. You know, you imagine that you are the blind beggar on the side of the road and you call out to Jesus. And you turn this process of using your imagination into into a prayer, expecting that God is going to speak to you in some way through that. Yeah. Okay. So when you you grew up in church and you say as a kid, you remembered being asked what you believed about God in the Bible, but you had no memory of ever being asked what your conversation with God was like or your experience with God or what God might be inviting you into. Uh, what's the distinction? Because we, we're supposed to teach our kids, right? We're supposed mm-hmm. to fill their little minds with all the right answers and then and then they'll go where they need to go yeah i don't buy it (laughs) i think i think that that's basically you know you asked about some of my journey is that you know i went through a period in my mid to early 20s not entirely unlike a lot of folks in their 20s my, my faith just completely unraveled and i think it unraveled in large part because Yeah, I I learned growing up that if you believe the right things, that that all of these things will get sorted out. And so I think that in a lot of ways, um, obviously, I think that belief is really important. I think, um, you know, what we think about God and what we think about Jesus are really, really important. But at the end of the day, um, we go back to experience, I think. And we go back to um, what our actual experience of God is like. And I take the Bible to be people's um, writings about how they experienced God, how they experienced Jesus. And so I just think it's unfortunate that we've boiled down our faith experience in a lot of ways to a particular kind of set of propositions that we ascribe to. 
Uh, my hope is that is that we can open up a little bit more formational conversations with our kids um, to set them up for for something deeper. Okay. Uh, uh, you quote James K. Smith saying, human beings are not only nor even primarily thinkers. We are not uh, we are we are not defined by what we know. I think recent history has proven him true. <laughs> <laughs> but we are defined by what we love, what we long for. Uh, mm. And you say your life with God has shifted from the importance of knowing to paying attention to what I was truly longing for. Unpack mm, that. I love that. Wow, that's such deep, wonderful thinking. Speaks to my heart. <laughs> yeah, well, that's James K. Smith uh, for you. Um, unpack that man how to do that easily is a challenge i think but um yeah how did you make that that shift when did that shift happen of of uh, defining yourself by what you know to defining yourself by what you love or desire and and why is that important yeah so i, I mean i think growing up in church um people told me that god loved me for example yeah. And I learned the gospel and I, I learned all about, you know, I went to Awana on Wednesday nights and I learned all the stories. And, Me too. And, um, but it wasn't until I experienced the love of God that I actually lived like I was loved, if that makes sense. So I think a lot of my early years in church, most of the, experience I had was that of guilt and frustration and um, a sense of, you know, does God actually really, is he okay with the fact that I screw up? Um, so it was actually when I went through the exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola uh, with a spiritual director that I got really in touch with the experience of God in prayer where I felt like God was um, speaking through these imaginative experiences and my life just looks a lot different with God. Now it's just not based upon me trying to like pull myself up by my, you know, knowledge bootstraps and just, you know, believe the right things. And like, I'm standing on the promises of God because I just think that that eventually fails people. Um, and I think James K Smith makes a great case for that. in some of his work is that, um, at the end of the day, we're going to be driven by our desires and our longings rather than the things that we think we believe. Yeah. So how do you go about reshaping? And then and then let's bring your kids into it. How do you go yeah. about shaping your kids' longings? Because TV and whatever's on their phones does a pretty good job shaping their longings. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think, and I'm still figuring this out. I mean, I've got four kids under the age of 13. And I think one of the ways that I'm working to shape their desires and, and their longings is to help them pay attention to what they actually are. So what is it that my kids are actually longing for, which leads them to the particular activities they're engaged in? So I think this book in particular, Imaginative Prayer, and it, it's got material there for parents to journey alongside of their kids. Yeah. Um, it's great material for, for parents to ask great questions of their kids. I'm just trying to, to, to help create a shared language between kids and adults about spiritual material. Um, because I just, I just found as a dad, I just, I, I just wasn't as interested in talking to them about propositional truth that we're supposed to learn, but I really am interested in what's going on in my kids' hearts. So it sounds like you're trying to get kids to be at least to a degree self-aware what's going on yeah. inside of them. But there's the prerequisite, and we come up against this all the time whenever we talk about spiritually forming kids or raising, growing them into disciples or however, whatever language you put on it. There's this barrier where the kids are only going to be engaged in those practices or proclivities if the parents are. So mm -hmm. you strike me as a fairly self-aware person. You've been through the Ignatian exercises. You probably do them still regularly with the consolation and desolation and the exam and all that sort of stuff. So you know what's going on inside of you, which gives you the capacity to help a kid sit down and think through what's going on inside of them. 
there's a lot of people who can't do that mm-hmm. because we don't practice it ourselves. We're too right. externally <clears throat> focused. We're too distracted all the time. Do you know what Jared says in the introduction to his book? What does he say? He says, <clears throat> it's hard to lead someone where we ourselves haven't gone. I wouldn't say it's just hard. It's probably impossible. Yeah, and I was I was going to just guess, because I haven't read his book, that his desire would be for those parents who may have an inkling of wanting to shepherd their children, if they would pick up the book, it would awaken that own desire in their own hearts to follow the exercises right along with mm-hmm. their children. Right, Jared? Am That's I exactly right? the way it's designed, yes. Can you give her a little ding, ding, ding? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. So how Thanks. could, okay, so I don't have a clue how to do imaginative prayer. I've never uh, gone down the road with Ignatius. I just haven't done any of this stuff. I'm staring at my kids. I pick up your book. What's, what's going to happen? I'm terrified. What's going to happen yeah. next? So you're going to open up to exercise one, and you're going to read effectively a script that I wrote out loud to your kids. And the script even begins with, okay, we're gonna go ahead and take a couple deep breaths together. Why don't we close our eyes? We'll invite the the Holy Spirit. And then you just read out loud this imaginative kind of script that I've that I've written. And the idea is that is that the kids with their eyes closed will begin to imagine themselves into that story that I have written. And you know, 80% of it um, is like really directly taken from scripture, scenes in scripture. Um, there are some other kind of concepts that we try to chew on in scripture that are that are not necessarily, um, you know, connected to a particular story of scripture. So I'll make something up, for example. Um, and that's what you do. And there's nine months of that material there. And there's questions throughout the week to help you, you know, when you're taking your kids to the grocery store, uh, I've, I've written a couple questions throughout the week for you to re-engage in that imaginative experience. That's really cool. I, I went through some of the stuff actually, and I kind of want to, I mean, my youngest child is now 20. It's, it's hard to I don't, I don't know. start over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I start with my, yeah. my grandkids. Have, yeah, you have a grandchild. I have a grandchild. But I also, you get, you get a do over. Isn't that great? do this with myself. Yeah. You know, I sure. say, okay, Phil, shut up and sit down. Um, so this is good to do like when you're in the car and you got the radio on in the background, you can just read one of these off real quick before you drop them off at soccer. You know, this is like, it's, it's okay. You can just cram this into the corners of your life. He's being facetious. That's like a great softball. Thanks, Phil. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, I think that, I think we need to slow down and I think we need to carve out. This, this, this book asks for one 30 minute spot a week and about five minutes a day. And and, and, so, and quiet. And quiet, some quiet, yeah. yeah. Um, I think we could we could manage 30 minutes of quiet for our family um, a week. Uh, you, yeah, you say, so, you say specifically, explicitly you say this book is not a guide for busy parents. That it's more a call for parents to slow down. Yeah. And you expect to sell copies of this book. <laughs> Well, that's what I'm hoping. I, I really do have a vision to help parents uh, re-engage in life with their kids. I, I just, you know, I, I've been a pastor eight, ten years now, and um, I don't know. I just think that we assume that the church, and it's their job yeah. when we drop them off on Sunday to form our kids. And I just don't think we're forming kids. I think that we need to take responsibility for our children, and that's going to mean taking responsibility to to reimagine kind of how our life actually works. Can I share a personal example of what he's talking about? So this past two weeks that I was in Normandy, um, as I set out, I really felt like this project is something that God has put in my heart two years ago and has been calling me out to do. And I've been following just one step at a time, even though I couldn't see and feel like maybe it will never happen, I knew I had to be obedient to the next step. And when I got to Normandy, um, I was in this incredibly beautiful countryside. It's way far away from three and a half hours from Paris, and it's filled with pastures and blue skies and clouds that float across the sky. And one morning, I woke up at five o'clock, and I just felt called outside. 
and I couldn't stop it. And I went outside in my bare feet in pajamas, and it was pitch black. And I looked up, and I could see stars that I'd never seen before, and a, you know, a full moon, and the clouds just passing over the moon. And I just stood there, you know, and and I couldn't leave because it was so powerful, you know. The and I felt the Lord just saying to me, you know, here's a gift, you know. This is I want you to see this and know that I love you and know that I'm. I'm creating this for you. You know, the next day I woke up early and it was come go for a walk. And you know, I went for a walk with a friend in a field and I found, you know, raspberries and I found a, you know, a random rusty horseshoe and little gifts and when I chose to open a gate, I walked into a big field where I saw, a, you know, different birds and things like that. So is that and it possible outside of northern France. And so so <laughs> so let me just say that I was so hungry for that, and I was so changed, powerfully changed from the inside, that that time alone, I will never be the same. You know, I came home and determined that I was gonna bring whatever that is into my moments here, and I have to staunchly guard them, you know, and if that means sitting at my kitchen table looking at the sun five minutes before my children come down and worshiping the Lord for that peace and quiet of that moment and seeking him out, then I've brought a bit of Normandy home. And I think once we taste the sweetness of that love relationship with our God, nothing will replace it. But doesn't it seem like we set up our lives here in the suburbs to avoid those moments Absolutely. at all costs. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But if we don't make a, a, a decided effort to seek that, if we as parents yeah. don't de don't determine that we are going to desire something else, then we never will know. Yeah. And and we will never be able to our, usher our children it's into kind of a place. Funny. We Most want of to us be. have figured out that if we are never deliberate about being healthy, we won't be healthy. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. kind of, that's kind of dawned on America. Like it's you, you're never accident. It doesn't mean it's working. Yeah. But we've mostly figured out that you're not accidentally going to become healthier. You know that for the first time in world history, yeah. more people die because they eat too much than die because they're eating too little. Mm. <sighs> really? Yeah. Does not surprise mm. me. Isn't that amazing though? Okay. I mean, the point being, most of the things that are causing problems are internal, Yeah, they're not external anymore. And do you know what I kept saying while I was over there? Everybody kept saying, Christian, do you want some breakfast? Or Christian, are you hungry for lunch? And my response, you know, knee-jerk response was, Normandy is my food. You know, I, I feel the love of this place. You and I really, Normandy? well, I really wasn't hungry. Something else <laughs> had taken over my appetite and I just wanted to experience this place. And it mm -hmm. really, truly did make me less hungry and I ate less food. It was such an odd thing I'd okay. never experienced. I've traveled overseas and lost my appetite. The book. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that means. The book is Imaginative Prayer by Jared Patrick Boyd. Uh, there are six different theological themes that you go through in this book, and it's and it's like a year's worth of stuff to do with your kids. Uh, the six themes are God's love, loving others, forgiveness, Jesus is the King, the good news of God, and the mission of God. And I think my favorite part, or just thumbing through this, my favorite part is that Everything that's taught in the book is summarized in a poem at the beginning of the book called uh, the Imaginative Prayer Creedal Poem, and it's an attempt. I mean, really, I would love to read it, but it's a little too long. But you just you got to pick up the book and just read the poem at the beginning that kind of summarizes. I assume this is your attempt to summarize. This is what I'm trying to pass on to my kids through the totality of these experiences. Yeah, basically each lesson gets boiled down to um, to one line of this kind of creedal poem. And the idea is that over nine months you could memorize the whole poem, yeah. so one sentence at a time. And these one sentences are supposed to be kind of um, earmarks to the larger imaginative story. So Christian, you were talk talking about this experience you had in Normandy. Um, my guess is, is that you could like pretty easily close your eyes and like get back to that visual spot where you see Normandy. In an um, that's just how our imagination works. That's how our memories work. Yeah. And so 
This book is designed in these imaginative ways to create memories. And then these sentences are designed to kind of provoke those imaginative memories. Wow. So, how has this, you've got four kids. Um, how has this affected them? I assume you've tried it out with them. I assume you're, you're not writing yeah. the book first and then trying. They're all church planting already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, um, I think that, and we've, we've piloted this in a couple um, churches as well. So I have okay. some supplementary material to make this a Sunday morning curriculum for kids. Um, it's on the website. And so we've, we've done this in about three or four churches. I've done this in my home. And, you know, it's hard to say how different my kids would be if they didn't experience these You could have done two so with it and kept two as a control group. <laughs> <laughs> and then, that's, you know, maybe, maybe when the grandkids come, we'll try that. But um, I think what it has done mainly is that we have really great conversations with our kids about, about faith, about their experience in worship, for example. Um, and I feel like my kids have language for that. They have language to articulate what they're experiencing, what they feel like God is inviting them into, what they're great grateful for. Um, you know, I don't know that I knew how growing up to even just name what I was feeling. Like I feel yeah. angry, I feel sad. And I, I think my kids, I think this has given my kids some tools for that as well unexpectedly. You, I was going to ask you um, what kind of progress do you see them making, but in your book you actually say, we need to leave behind the part of us that wants to quantify the progress. <laughs> That's very unevangelical. So, come on, man. If we can't keep score, how do we know if we're winning? Your soul will tell you. <laughs> For those of you just listening, yeah, Jared is just shaking that. his head. He's just staring at me yeah. and shaking his head. I don't know. I just think I think that um, I think we we run into trouble when we try to kind of quantify and and I, actually I think it sets our kids up for some spiritual disaster when we when we attach you know significant moments based upon you know when I mean, we had Bible sword drills growing up I'm sorry for I had them too I had them yeah. too me too so you know the people who are quickest at getting to the spot in their Bible, Bible all of a sudden feel better and the people who aren't don't. I just, yeah. I just, that's dumb. Why are we doing that? It just doesn't make sense. So Because if it's worth doing, it's worth seeing who's the best at doing it. Exactly. That is right. our, that is the American credo. I mean, any new, any, anytime someone invents a new vehicle, you then need to start a league to see who can drive it the fastest or jump it the farthest. We cannot stop competing with each other. We are such a competitive culture. So you you realize what you're doing is kind of countercultural. Do you realize that? <laughs> I do, I do. I mean, it's just at this point, it's run of the mill for me because, you know, God's told me to plant a monastic community. So I'm, right. I'm in, getting a little- In that, Columbus, so. Ohio. I think we need to go for a visit. Is there anything there yet to see? Uh, well, right now we, we've gathered some folks. Uh, we're about one year into a church plant. Um, Do you have so a gift we, shop? Is it, <laughs> have, you, have you turned out your first batch of beer yet? No, no. no. We are in a neighborhood where beer would not be appropriately contextualized for oh. ministering people. We're in, a, we're in like the center of a pretty addicted neighborhood. Oh, so okay. In a, Never mind. Nice. Oh, oh so I'm, we're gonna, I'm sorry. We're yeah. going to do some different things. We're going to roast some coffee and we're going to. Yeah. Cream soda. Cream soda. Cream soda. There you go. That's a, that's a great idea. <laughs> Made by monks. Okay. Made by monks. The book is called Imaginative Prayer. Our guest is Jared Patrick Boyd. Seriously, check it out. Even if you don't have kids, because. There's a kid in you that uh, would benefit from going yeah. through this as well. I first, I first started practicing what I probably didn't know was imaginative prayer when I was a college student, and I wouldn't have, I, I don't think I'd been exposed yet to Ignatian practices, but going, like if I could rewind the tape and start over at like 15, I'd probably end up as a Jesuit. But th th that practice of imaginative prayer, to reaffirm what Jared is saying, it probably had a deeper impact on my life than any class I took or any course of study in scripture. Um, it, it's an incredibly formative practice that goes all the way back to the Psalms. And, and so this is a great way to even introduce yourself as an adult to these ideas. And if you have a family, even better, you can practice it that way. So I could not encourage you more to get this. Okay. 
Good. That was a pretty good endorsement. Mm-hmm. You should ring the bell. Yeah, thanks. Ding! Mm-hmm. Magic of prayer. Um, do you have a, oh, you're working on another... There's like more of this coming, like another year's worth you're trying to develop? Uh, I hope so. It obviously, it depends on if the book sells well, then oh. I can write another book. So. Don't, don't measure your success by progress. Mm-hmm. Oh. <laughs> you just need to make the other book, okay? Ah. All right, I'm going to wrap it up. Hey, everybody, put your hands in the air. It's time to take a chance on some imaginative prayer. I think you'll, uh, if you get to know Jared Patrick Boyd, you'll find he's a lot smarter than that old guy, Christopher Lloyd. Oh, I really think the experience isn't odd that we can actually have a real experience with God. So... I really think you should you should try to care about taking your kids through some imaginative prayer and we can meet Jesus uh, when we're inside in there in our imaginations and my phone's ringing. We will see you next time. <laughs> hey, hey, Sky yeah, has what? a new book. Oh, Sky has a new book, but it's not out yet. So it's it's not. Is it out? No, I mean you can pre-order it's not it. Out. But, yeah. You can oh, next, you, you next can week. pre-order it. We'll talk about it next week. Okay, we'll talk about it next week. Uh, Jared, thanks for being on the show. Appreciate it very much. Thanks a lot. Nice a lot to meet fun, you. Bye, Jared. And we will see you all next week. Goodbye, Bye, everybody. The Phil Fisher Podcast is produced by Phil Fisher Enterprises and recorded live at Jellyfish Lab Studios. This episode was edited by Jason Rugg and was fact-checked by absolutely no one. For more information, go to philfisher.com. <laughs>